would share this as widely as possible. It will be on the West Country Voices YouTube channel and Mark's organisation, the 99% organisation, will also be disseminating it. So without further ado, just to give just a rough idea, Mark's going to introduce himself and talk about the format and um, thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much, Anthea. Um, yes, so I'm Mark Thomas from the 99% uh, organisation, which is an all-volunteer group of about 4,000 people. Uh, nobody gets paid, but people have done some really remarkable things. I don't want to take any more time than that. Uh, Stephen, do you want to just say who you are? Uh, and then we'll uh, hear who Mark is. Okay, so uh, my name's um, Stephen Reicher. I am a social psychologist. I work at the University of St Andrews. And you will probably be wondering what the hell has a social psychologist got uh, to be doing at, a, at, a, at a, an event like this? Well, the first thing I would say is the one word that has dripped off everybody's tongue from Nigel Farage to Keir Starmer is the word trust. They all talk about trust and they all talk about rebuilding trust and they don't seem to have an idea of what it means to rebuild trust. My work is very much, I work on group processes. I'm very interested in uh, the ways in which we create a sense of community and create trust. And the one practical expression I've given to that was during the pandemic, I was involved in the UK and the Scottish advisory groups and also in Independent Sage. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Stephen and Mark. Thank you, Mark. I'm Mark Kieran. I run an organisation called Open Britain. Open Britain, if you have heard of it, was the official Remain side of the Brexit referendum and then the organisation that was behind the people's vote uh, in those Brexit war years, as we call them. Uh, these days, Open Britain is focused on making democracy work for everyone and uh, the flagship policy change that we are fighting for is a switch from first past the post to proportional representation, but we have some other things which may come up in this uh, discussion today. And la last of all, you will have seen a spare seat, and that is for Alexandra Hall Hall. Because of football, <laughs> <laughs> we are, we've had to reconfigure, and be, we've been shifted up in the schedule, but she will, so there's now a clash, but she will be joining us about halfway through the session. So if you don't know who Alexandra is, uh, she's a, a career diplomat, she was um, UK ambassador to, uh, to Georgia, based in Tbilisi, and then she served as the Brexit envoy to the US, and she resigned from that post because of the amount of lying that was going on in the handling of Brexit. She resigned in uh, 2019. Uh, so she has uh, also a lot to say about truth and trust. Uh, similar to uh, to Stephen, uh, so she she will be joining us unfortunately about half an hour late, uh, and she will be sitting there. So without further ado, let me just introduce what we're going to talk about today. Of course, is the first full day of Keir Starmer's prime ministership, and he has quite a challenge to. Uh, rebuild the country. And this is an interesting place to be talking about rebuilding the country because it was at Dartington that Michael Young, as many of you will know, drafted major parts at least of the Labour Party uh, 1945 manifesto. So it's interesting just to compare the state of the country today with the state in 1945 on a various dimensions, materially but also in terms of the national mood, in terms of things like trust and solidarity, uh, and uh, uh, intellectually and democratically. So materially, Clement Attlee had a much more difficult job, actually, than Keir Starmer has, because uh, at the end of the war, debt to GDP, the debt to GDP ratio was 250%. It's around about 100% today, which is, in fact, roughly the 300-year average. Uh, so no com comparison there. There were about 5% of the population mobilised into the armed forces. Suddenly you've got 5% of the population doing things you don't want them to do. You've had about 5% of national wealth destroyed uh, and a million people killed. So um, that's on a material, from a material perspective, that's a very serious issue. 
But if you think about it f from the point of view of the national mood, very different. The national mood at the end of the war was one of solidarity and hope. Solidarity because to a first order approximation, everybody had, had been in it together. Everybody, if they'd stayed home, had been at rationing, and if they hadn't stayed at home, they'd been fighting. Everybody had similar experiences. Uh, and uh, so there was a, a genuine sense of solidarity. There was also a sense of hope, because at the beginning of the war, it was pretty clear that Britain was probably going to lose. And then it became clear after the Battle of Britain that, well, we probably won't lose, but we can't actually win it. And then after America joined the war, it became clear that, well, perhaps we can actually win this thing. And then, of course, we were on the winning side. So uh, a, a mood of hope and solidarity. Intellectually, uh, in particular in terms of economics, the dominant mindset was Keynesianism, which is a very can-do way of looking at the economy. And Keynes had written a book, How to Pay for the War, which told them how to pay for the war, how, how to get through without starving the poor, etc. And it worked, and he was intellectually dominant. Now, none of those things are, are, are true today. We, we have a population which is divided. This election hasn't really been an election of hope. It's been, I think, there's perhaps a sense of relief that we haven't got four more years, five more years of Conservative party, but there isn't a, a, an enormous upspring of hope and, and certainty that some enormous rebuilding is going to take place. And democratically, of course, at the end of the Second World War, the far right, which had been strong in Britain before the war, had become absolutely unthinkable. Oswald mostly had been interned. Now we're at a state where the far right is, is resurgent. So we, the background is um, actually probably a more difficult challenge for Starmer uh, on balance than it was for Attlee, which is a very sobering thought. So we're going to just uh, ha have a panel discussion and then take uh, questions from you uh, about five key issues. So the first one is what we've called uh, defensive constitutional reform. And what do I mean by defensive? Well, our constitution such as it is, has always been based on, on the good chaps theory. And if you have good chaps, you don't need to have a constitutional restriction that says you're not allowed to implement a policy that you know will harm the vast bulk of your population because a good chap would never think of doing it. But actually, we've had several policies in the last five years and in the, over the last uh, 15 years, which have, um, uh, 14 years, which have done precisely that. And... Um, you can probably think of several examples. We, if you look at what happened in the States when uh, Trump was president, you can see that when you get a bad actor in charge, they will start systematically to dismantle all the checks and balances. And if you think about it here, you can see less dramatically but the same process has been underway. Uh, uh, the, our power to have judicial reviews of ministerial decisions is curtailed. Our ability to protest peacefully is curtailed. Our human rights, even our membership of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, is, has been under threat. Very many aspects of our constitution have been under threat. So defensive constitutional reform, not limited to uh, PR, are important issues. So that's the first one. The second one is what we call going post-fact. Post if you think about the, the three biggest most consequential policies for, for normal people's lives of, of the last uh, 14 years. There was austerity, and austerity was justified on the basis that we'd never had debt so high. Well, as I explained, even today, our debt is at the 300-year average. It was based on post-fact rationalisation. Then we had Brexit, which was based on so many post-fact rationalizations that I'm not going to try to list them. And then the handling of COVID was based on a, a lot of counterfactual stuff. Independent SAGE actually was formed partly because the government was ignoring too many facts. So somehow we have to get back to fact-based policy. Then we need to have policies for solidarity and abundance, policies which will actually grow the pie but also share it fairly. Now, as some of you will know, Formulating policy is genuinely very, very difficult. Each individual policy is very complex. But 
when you think about policies in aggregate, it's fairly simple. Every policy either grows the pie or it doesn't, and it either shares it fairly or it doesn't. So if it does both, if it both grows the pie and shares it fairly, that's good growth, and that's the kind of policy that you would like to see a great deal of. So examples of that would be things like investing in a green transition, investing in healthcare, investing in education. Everybody benefits, the whole economy benefits, but also everybody in the economy benefits. You can also have captured growth policies. They might be things that on, in themselves are quite a good idea, but the benefits of them go to a tiny group and the cost is, is, is borne by the people least able to bear it. So uh, I'll give an example in a minute when I've talked about balancing policies, which the idea of those is that they might not actually grow the pie, but they help to make sure that you share it fairly. And those are very useful if you've had some captured growth policies. The example that is um, alive in my mind at the moment is uh, in France, you may remember Macron sparked the Gilets Jaunes movement because he wanted to introduce, for, for environmental reasons, a levy on fuel. Now, in itself, that's not a bad policy, but the people who would have felt that most painfully were the bottom 25% of the income distribution. Had he been looking at it and saying, well, this is a captured growth policy, I need a balancing policy, he would have said, well, I'm not going to do that then. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a green dividend paid to the bottom 25%, and I'm going to fund it with a fuel levy. And then there would have been no gilet jaune movement. That's actually what they did in Canada, something a bit like that. And then finally, we've got vulture policies, which are policies which neither grow the pie nor share it fairly. Of course, we don't want to see any of those, but, for example, Brexit is, is such an example. Uh, if you happen to be a hedge fund that was on the inside track, you could make millions or tens of millions in one night on Brexit. But if you're a normal person, or indeed most of the British economy, you suffered seriously. So getting those, uh, that, a, a sensible portfolio of policies, rather than just thinking about ind individual policies, is really critical. Then we have the question of investment in the future. It's very clear that we've been under-investing both the public sector and the private sector in the country, and, and we need to reinvest. That poses two very big questions. One is, where's the money going to come from? And the other one is, where are the real resources going to come from? And finally, we've got a question about how do we get businesses to make a positive contribution to, the, to this sort of change? Uh, we've actually had a very, very low growth economy, which is very bad for businesses, and a lot of smaller businesses have entered a doom loop. We have higher rates of bankruptcy now than uh, at the height of the global financial crisis, which is quite scary. But also something, something qualitative has changed, which is that businesses, because they can't really grow, because the economy is not growing, they have to cut their costs. And one of the easiest ways to cut costs is to externalise all your costs to uh, the rest of society by polluting, by not paying your taxes, etc. So it's vital also that we get that right. I don't think we're going to have time to cover all five of those in great detail because <laughs> each one of them you could write a book about. But I think the first two or three we, we really will uh, look to dig into. So uh, there is more on the 99% website <coughs> where, uh, and, and indeed in the book for those of you who want to look. But uh, now uh, we have a, an expert panel or we have three quarters of an expert panel um, and um, they have a lot to say on some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Reicher, if I can point, um, ask you to take over now and for people to be ready for questions after the panel. Thank you. Okay, so we're deferring curing cancer and learning to play the flute to the next workshop. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, I suppose the thing that struck me most about this election is I always felt that in many ways the really important election is the next election in the sense that Labour was almost bound to come to power in the last few months. I think that was apparent and the self-emulation of the Conservatives was truly spectacular. You have to congratulate them on, on, on getting it that far wrong. But the real question was what was going to happen in the next election? What's going to happen in 2029? Because in many ways, this was the most dishonest election in my lifetime. 
the real issues that really affected people were the complete collapse of the of the public sector. I mean, the fact that you know every day you look at the figures, they go up. So you know, the last time I looked, it was around eight million. It's probably gone up from there. That eight million people waiting to go to hospital. Quite remarkable. I mean, quite <coughs> remarkable figures. You know, uh, one in seven of the population. And then you know, the fact that literally our schools and hospitals are collapsing because we paid for cheap concrete. The fact that our universities are going bankrupt. When I was little, it's probably the same for you because I think I'm probably the same sort of age as a lot of people here. The one thing we used to say about being in Britain uh, to, you know, to, to, to console ourselves for everything that was bad in Britain, like the food and the weather and the politics, was the fact that at least you could drink the water. And when you went abroad, you know, you said, all oh, right, you can't even drink the water. Well, we can't even go swimming in our rivers. We can't go swimming in the sea. And in many places, we can't drink the water. Public sector completely collapsing because of underinvestment over more than a decade. And rather than talk about that, the obsession was with what we're not going to do. We're not going to do anything about uh, taxation with the consequence that you've raised expectation you're going to do something, but you don't have the means to do it. Because, yes, of course we want to grow. Of course we do, but growth isn't entirely in our control. And the notion we can save things through so-called efficiency savings is always a complete fantasy. At some level or another, you've got to talk about redistribution. At some level or another, if you want to improve things, there are some people who aren't going to be uh, that well off. I mean, remember at the end of the Second World War, the marginal rate of uh, top tax was 97% because it was accepted that those who could bear it should pay for the war. Well, in a similar way, we've had to pay huge amounts for the COVID crisis, but nobody is making the same debate about who should bear that cost. So this, this fantasy election which ignored the real problems, quite apart from the, the minor fact that the, the, the part of the planet might be uninhabitable quite, quite soon. We, we didn't talk about those things <coughs> at all. Okay. There was a fundamental dishonesty. So the question is, what happens if we don't make a change? Well, we are seeing the consequence of that throughout Europe. We're seeing it in the rise of right-wing populism of people who aren't just re uh, rejecting particular politicians, but rejecting the political system because they don't believe in it at all. And instead, they have charismatic messiah-type figures who show themselves to violate the rules of the political, who are outside the political and will miraculously take us to the promised land. Now, as I say, I thought we were a few years off it, but in many ways, the election has shown to me that the wolf is not in the woods. The wolf is at the door, and if we don't do anything, the wolf will be in the house next time round. Look, look at a few of the figures, which I think are really telling. I mean, yes, of course, you know, it is good that there is, we've got rid of the Tories and there's a Labour majority, but of course, Starmer got less votes than Jeremy Corbyn. Less votes than Jeremy Corbyn. Isn't that quite remarkable, since we're told that Jeremy Corbyn is all that is bad in the world and Keir Starmer is all in good in the world? Well, how come he lost votes? 60% of people, only 60% of people in some constituencies, inner city constituencies in Manchester, had 40% of people voting. They're profoundly disillusioned. The top two parties right, got less than 60% of the vote. So got less than 36% of the electorate. So the top two parties together get a third of the electorate. And then, of course, there's the rise of reform. There was a lovely, I don't know if anybody listened to the news quiz. I like the news quiz. And at lunchtime, somebody described the election. I think it was the best description of the election. He said, um, you know, the election was a little bit like a race where your principal rival, halfway through the race, uh, chops off their leg and then tries to finish as two athletes. It's a good way of <laughs> summarising what things were about. So the question is, how do we deal with that rise of populism? How do we deal with that distrust in the political? And instead, if you want to put a figure on distrust in the political, every year the British Social Attitude Survey comes out. Huge survey, huge numbers of questions. It asks about political trust. And it asks people, um, uh, when they're in a corner, do you think politicians tell the truth? Okay. The percentage of people who said yes, mostly, 
or always, was 5%. Now, if you do these surveys, 10% of people will tell you that the world is flat. So that means twice as many people think the world is flat than trust politicians to tell the truth when it matters. Okay. And it's funny, and it's awful. And it's powerfully awful, because that's what gives Farage his possibility. So what do we do about it? Now, the emphasis always is on delivery. And that, of course, is true. Okay. You've got to make a difference in people's lived experience. You've got to get rid of the uh, wage freeze of the last uh, two decades. You've got to make sure that people can afford housing and have decent housing. You've got to make sure that they can have appointments when they're unwell. You've got to deliver. And as I say, I'm a little bit pessimistic because I'm not sure where the resource will come from. But trust isn't only about doing things for people. It's fundamentally about doing things with people. For people to feel that the politicians are not only on their side, but are part of a shared community. That they understand people's situation. And if you don't do that, then you undermine trust. I'll give you a simple example. The rule of six. Remember the rule of six? You could only meet six people outdoors. Okay. Now that was premised on a particular conception of the family. The notion was there are only so many people in the family, probably two, possibly you've got a, you know, a granny living with you, possibly three, so two households can meet if you allow six adults to meet outside. It misses the fact entirely that different communities have got different family structures. Ethnic minorities tend to have bigger families. So what this says to them, what this rule says to them is the establishment who make up these rules don't understand us and don't care about us. Again, if you look at COVID, 18% of white people were vaccine hesitant, getting on for 70%, about two thirds of uh, black people, black British people were covered hesitant. Now, was it because they were selfish, as Michael Gove put it, or that they didn't understand these people <laughs> are stupid? Of course not. About the same time that those figures came out, a House of Commons and House of Lords joint report showed that two-thirds of black people do not think that the NHS is designed for their needs. It was lack of trust, because you don't understand people's situation and you're not doing things uh, uh, that take into account who they are. So it's not enough to do things for people. The simple point I want to make, and it's a profoundly radical point, is you've got to do things with people. If we swap Tory paternalism, and it was paternalistic, you know, uh, Boris Johnson's shtick is all, don't worry little people, don't worry your heads about it, I'll do it for you. His boosterism, his optimism, his classic paternalism. Father will look after uh, you, you don't need to worry your pretty little heads about it. If we replace that with labour command and control paternalism, and one of the problems of the welfare state was, in many ways, it did take away choice, then we're going to be in trouble. Because the thing about populism and the thing about trust is in the end, it's not just about things are getting worse, it's I have no control. And the reality, then the political reality, is probably the bottom two thirds of the population have no political control overall. They have no input into policy. So what does that mean? And I'll just finish because I've been talking for too long, very briefly. First of all, I think it needs, means that we need to think about democracy in the social and not just the political sphere. Classically, the notion of social democracy was extending democracy from the political into the economic and into the social sphere. We need to do that. We need to do, and it sounds radical, but it's not that radical, they do it in Germany, we need to make sure that um, uh, workers are properly uh, represented on the boards of all their enterprises. All the top companies should have a third of their board being workers. We should do exactly the same things in all other institutions. We should particularly do it in terms of media, because the media are critical, and the myth, the, the internet, 
would be a great boon to democracy is undermined precisely because it is more undemocratic in its ownership. One or two people own this thing, define the algorithms, set them up to create division and argument because if something is controversial, more people look at it. So we've got to think about involving people in ownership of all that affects their lives. We've got to think about it in terms of decision-making processes. The things that are going on elsewhere in Europe, Spain for instance, in terms of uh, citizen juries, citizen budgeting, um, it's not enough. I, mean, I, I, I noticed today that Keir Starmer was talking about meeting the mayor. It's good. It's a good step forward. We need to go further in terms of forms of grassroots democracy. And the final thing, I just want the point I want to make is, I think we need to rethink governance. If you think about the pandemic, going back to the pandemic, it showed us that when push really comes to shove, the state can't look after us. There aren't enough functionaries, there aren't enough state functionaries in the country if you're poorly to check if you're okay. Uh, if you need somebody to deliver food for you, if you need somebody to take the, the, the dog for the walk. That was done by 12 to 14 million people who volunteered in mutual aid groups. And they were wonderful. And that created community. And that looked after us in the first wave, not the second wave, because people were burnt out because they didn't have the resources to do it. So how do you scaffold that self-organisation? How do you provide the resources to help people form local self-help groups? How do you give them the meeting places, the IT? Um, how do you give them the resources so that, uh, for instance, they can have people look after their kids so they can come out for meetings and the meetings are truly inclusive? That that form of communal self-organisation and resilience isn't the cheap option. It's often treated as that. Resilience is what the state means when it says, oh, we can't afford it anymore, you do it. We need to think of new forms of governance so that we have a Labour Party that doesn't just do things for people, it does things with people, and it does that at every level that affects our lives, the economic institutions in which we work, the uh, political institutions in which we work, the community organisations through which we live. And if the Labour Party does something with people and achieves things, then it puts a knife in the heart of the two th main things which sustain populism and undermine trust. The notion that things are getting worse and they don't care, and the notion that we can't do anything about it because we have a no say over our own lives. I'm sorry, I, pro I probably went on far too long, so I'm terribly sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Open Britain is focused on uh, the, the, the sort of element of making sure that the, the tools that we as a society have to make change uh, actually work properly. Democracy is one of the most fundamental tools that we have and especially in the immediate aftermath of an election it's often very clear that it doesn't work. Uh, it certainly doesn't work as most people want it to. And the difficulty with that challenge is that most people don't know a great deal about democracy and most people, if truth be told, don't care a great deal about it, even though they know they should. They're busy living their lives, bringing up their children, doing all the things that ordinary people do. Uh, it's a very dry subject which only odd people like us uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. So Open Britain, uh, as I say, we've, we've looked at democracy right across the, the piece. Uh, we have talked to people in Parliament, we've talked to activists on the ground, uh, politicians themselves, members of, the House of, members of the House of Lords, people from all different angles in, in that space. And we came up with a short list of 24 things that we thought needed to be done to fix uh, democracy. And we published those in a, a report last year with, uh, with uh, the, sort of working with other, other organisations, including Mark actually, Mark contributed to that. Uh, right across the democracy sector. Now, anybody who does anything with the public will know uh, you can't go out and sell them 24 different things. People just don't have time to listen to that. So we said, what, how can we distill this? What is the very essence of this agenda that we uh, need to carry out to make democracy work for everyone? And we, we boiled it down to five things. And some of those things, I'm very pleased to, to say, have started to sort of cut through into the mainstream discussion. In, in and around this election that we've just had. Th those five things are 
uh, a shift from first past the post to proportional representation. Um, I guess that's going to come up in the in, in the discussion, so I'll, I'll probably leave that there. Um, eradicating dark money. It, it's uh, anybody who looks into this is always shocked at the routes uh, uh, by which dark money uh, is is channeled into politics, especially by the hard right uh, organisations that are that are on the on the rise now. Uh, there are all sorts of mechanisms that are put in place to make sure that political parties register and publish details of their donations. But if you just take one step further back from that, you can find the space you need to, to cover up what you're doing. Unincorporated uh, organisations. We, we, we could set up a, 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 an organisation, the Dartington Democracy Forum, uh, and you could all give me uh, five pounds and I could make a donation on behalf of uh, that organisation, and then that bit is published, that bit is disclosed, nothing about who you are or where your money comes from, whether it's legitimate money, whether you're the local drugs dealer. Uh, there, there are lots of ways uh, around it, and that needs to be clamped down on. It, it, the, the, the second thing is the media regulation, already been mentioned. Democracy is about people making decisions that they want to make because they are in their best interest, their best interests of them, their families, their communities, and their country, and indeed the world now. Um, you can only make those decisions if you have access to good, reliable information. And unfortunately, we're living through a, a time when most of us don't have automatic access to good, reliable information, whether that's because we still uh, put our trust and faith in the established media, or because we are plugged into the social media world, um, all of those things are moving almost imperceptibly, slowly, over time. Uh, but we have, when we stop and look at it, got a situation where people do not automatically have access to reliable information. And that is a, a, an incredible thing to, to say. Um, third thing, our rights are being <coughs> eroded. There is no point in having democratic rights if you're not free to exercise them. And so we all busily talk about um, living in a democracy even people like Nigel Farage and Swell and Bravman will talk about living in a, in a democracy and then in the very next breath tell you that they're introducing legislation which is going to clamp down on your ability to go and protest when they start to do something that you feel is, is wrong. Uh, so we have to protect our rights, access to the ECHR, the right to protest, the right to do, do the things that sort of organisations like ours uh, do. And, and the, the, the other uh, element is about increasing the, the, the franchise, getting more people involved. Some of the participation rates in this election have been incredibly low. Um, and the system that we have first past the post means that that uh, is translated into a hugely distorted uh, outcome. So Labour sitting on roughly two thirds of the seats in Parliament on about one third of the, the votes. You know, just, just, just that sing single fact alone suggests something uh, needs to be done. And within that, the sort of iconic uh, recommendation that we're making is that we give 16 and 17 year olds uh, the vote because uh, when I was young, people used to say, look, 16 and 17 year olds think they know everything. They don't. Uh, but most of the 16 and 17 year olds that I speak to these days are a world ahead of anywhere I was when I was that age. They have access to information from all over the world. They discuss that information with people. They challenge themselves much more robustly. Um, and, and I think it, it's in all our best interests to get the younger generation involved in our diplomatic uh, discussions, uh, our, our democratic discussions, um, because it's their future that they're, they're <coughs> So I don't, I don't know, should I leave it there? So I, People always say it must be great being the, the, the guy that runs a big organisation like Open Britain with a quarter of a million people. You can say things and they will listen to you. And I, I always turn that round and say actually the best part of it is listening to what they have to say. Uh, it's, it's all very well saying things to people but when we've got you guys in the room I think uh, we, we should take the opportunity of hearing what you have to say. Can I, can I just tell you one very, very briefly, oh here comes Alexandra, so I'll make it very, very brief indeed. In fact, I'll, I'll defer to Alexandra first, I think. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for, for coming on. I need something stronger than water. Yes, you're going to be able to come down from, from that. 
So what we've been talking about really is about how we rebuild trust in politics, how we get rebuild engagement in our political um, scheme, how we operate in a world where a government has just been elected on very, very few votes and not, not a lot of them that sticky. Um, so that's where we are. Well, also, uh, well, the, the, the other important point was, was this question of bad actors, mm. which oh, you've just been talking about, I guess, Alexandra, <laughs> uh, that, you know, we demonstrably do not have constitutional safeguards in the UK which protect against bad actors. It's all been based on this good, good chaps theory and perhaps it, we sort of muddled through for quite a while when, when we had people who were essentially good chaps Maybe they were competent, maybe they weren't, but they were good chaps. But if we get people who are not good chaps, and I think we've seen quite a bit of that over the last 14 years, and there's a real risk that we might see more of it uh, after this current term. Uh, so, so, so there was a, uh, we, we've talked quite a bit about engagement. We've talked about that need for protection, actually, to put some, something hard in place. And we talked about... Um, it's something which I guess is very close to your heart, Alexandra, which is the truth and, you know, going post-fact and how, how many of our policies have been based on things which are simply not true and um, how we don't have a media landscape that prevents that sort of thing from happening. So I'm sure you've got a few things mm -hmm. to say on some of that. So I'm here to save the West. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have... I ended just the session with Trump by giving some ideas on what we can do to sort of guard against and protect ourselves. Um, so thank you, and, and apologies if I repeat or come up with stale ideas that you've already discussed. But what I would like this government to do, and I feel is essential for our country, is to renew our system of governance and engage citizens in that process. And the way I would like to see it done is for the Labour Party and the Labour government to announce that they are establishing a constitutional commission who, over the next five years, will conduct hearings and citizens' assemblies around the country and look at the examples of constitutions around the rest of the world and different structures of government and discuss uh, how government is conducted in the UK and initiate a national discussion on what works in our system and which bits of our system we remain attached to and that we like or that we feel have served us well in the past but could do with a little bit of updating um, and which parts of other countries' systems that we are attracted to and to have a proper national discussion, for example, about the pros and cons of proportional representation versus first past the post. Not based on yesterday's election result, but looking over the longer term, the pros and cons of a constitutional monarchy, the pros and cons of an upper chamber, an elected upper chamber, the House of Lords, or other options. And, I, and we have to avoid the mistakes of Brexit which was when one political party arrogated the results of the referendum, interpreted it unilaterally and in the most hardline way possible. And so that's why I think we need a constitutional commission. It is not for Labour to initiate reform of the House of Lords. It is for we, the people, to initiate reform of our system. And by having a, a constitutional commission, it buys Labour some breathing space to focus on the immediate issues of government. It also allows people to be involved in that discussion. And the very process of involvement in that discussion may expose issues of identity and culture and community. And then, it, and then Labour can campaign in the next election with that in their manifesto that we commit to implement these proposals or the Conservatives can say, we commit to implement these parts of the recommendations. But it allows us to have a discussion. The other thing I would like to see happen is, of course, a proper code of conduct for um, elected MPs and senior officials and a sort of public pledge of integrity and a proper, truly independent <coughs> advisor. Um, I would also like to see an independent body to scrutinise appointments to the House of Lords. Those are sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, the third thing I think I would like to see is for there to be a requirement for any time the government receives legal advice or uh, 
financial advice, for example, from the Office of Budget Responsibility, those documents are publicly available documents. So that if, for example, you're worried about Israel and Gaza and there's challenges, but what's the legal advice to the government? Or if you're worried about the contents of Liz Truss's budget, we get an independent assessment of that. So some of the documents that are sort of professional assessments are laid in the public debate, and then it's not a laid in the public domain. So those are three things I think we could do. The fourth thing I would like to see happen is for there to be... Um, it's possibly because I live in the States that I still quite like some aspects of the US system, though I completely recognise we're heading for an iceberg. Um, but I, um, I like the system of public hearings for appointments to public bodies and to cabinet-level positions. And one thing that has really hampered the quality of government in the UK over the last few years is the constant churn of ministers um, appointed for loyalty over competence and uh, with often absolutely no experience of their relevant ministerial brief. And I think it would be a good idea to have hearings um, and confirmation hearings so that we get some sense of whether these people are up to the job for which they've been appointed and some idea of what they plan to do with that job. So I will stop there. Right, before I turn it over to you, I just wanted to give you a little insight very briefly into a, a democratic initiative that I've been involved in and, and just talk about some of the pitfalls. Because the South Devon primary, which you may or may not have heard of, and other primaries that followed, were a way of bringing people together to choose the candidate behind whom they would rally to ensure that the Conservatives got removed. And in the particular constituency in which I was involved, there'd been a Tory for 100 years. Now, it was very successful, and the people want more as a result of it. But my question for the panel is, when we were out canvassing and talking to people on the street, there is a vast swathe of people who have been completely hoodwinked by the press, who are completely disaffected with all politics, and even our form of participatory democracy, as we saw it, was for them the act of an elite still, or of a privileged bubble, and therefore not something that they wanted to engage with. And these people who see, for many of them, they see not voting as a protest, tragically, or they see going for the populist, the reform argument, is somehow their last ditch attempt to say, you do not serve us, and paradoxically to give their vote to the very, very last people who will ever, ever serve their interests. So I think what really bothers me is how do we engage the people beyond our bubble, and there are millions of them. So I'm kind of very kindly throw that <laughs> to you and hopefully that is a question that a number of people would like to ask. Uh, well, I mean, that uh, is, is, is clearly a very important question with two, <coughs> two dimensions. One was uh, you were talking about how effectively a lot of these people have been brainwashed by the press. That, that has sort of come up in our discussion, but we haven't talked about the resolution to that. Mm. Um, and it's a very, very difficult thing to resolve because we, we are in a position in this country where about 60% by readership of the press is in the hands of four people, all of whom are uh, living offshore. They're extreme right wing. They're not democratic. They're tax avoiding. They want to dismantle the welfare state. Um, and so they are very deliberately poisoning the minds of those people. And the instant that the government says they're going to do something about it, they will scream that this is anti-democratic, it mm. is an assault on uh, freedom of the press, this is uh, a, a communist regime beginning, you know, this is the step before the construction of the gulags. So uh, f from Labour's perspective, this is a very, very difficult issue. They probably won't get much of a honeymoon anyway, but... Um, the instant they say they're going to tackle that, the assault will come. And my personal feeling on that is that uh, then they should act while the mandate is fresh. 
it's fresh today, it'll be fresh tomorrow, even in a month's time it won't be quite so fresh. So if I were them, I would say, look, you know, if we don't tackle uh, this issue of uh, not just the press but also um, social media, and actually the top management of the BBC has been mm. seeded over the last few years with people who are <coughs> uh, Tory party members, Tory donors, etc. If they don't tackle that very, very quickly, they'll never tackle it. And then, as several people have said, it's, it's the next election where we might actually see something terrible happen, as, as indeed, you know, in the States, um, that Biden has... The danger is that Biden's been a, a moderately positive interlude in a, in a descent towards dictatorship that Starmer could be, his government, if he's not careful, will be a moderately positive interlude in a descent towards dictatorship. So, mm. so my first part of the answer uh, would be to say they, uh, this is a really difficult thing to do, but they should uh, grasp that nettle very, very fast. Um, in terms of how we, we talk to those people, I mean, I have to admit, I'm very bad at it. I talk the way I talk. Uh, I, I don't come across uh, as a sort of man of the people. I hate football, so I was particularly, <laughs> particularly <laughs> perturbed by the fact that this session was disrupted in order for people to be able to watch football. Uh, so I'm probably not the one to answer that. I think, uh, mm. Stephen, you're probably better at answering the second part of the question. Yeah, because I love football. I, I, exactly. I do. <laughs> But then again, I live in Scotland and our team's been knocked out, so who cares about it? Okay. Um, I am, it's true, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I am not an establishment figure. You might have worked that out. But the, the, the one time I got close to the establishment was in 2016. And at the end of the year, the British Academy holds a little review of the year. And it's held in the headquarters of the British Academy, which is Gladstone's old house on the Mall. It's beautiful. And uh, it's in the music room, and a string quartet is playing in the corner, and champagne canopies, and the, and, and the cream of the British press, the Financial Times, the BBC, and so on. And uh, for some reason, they invited me to be one of those who summarised things, and I was talking about Brexit. And my argument was, we are the problem. We like to think, and often we think, oh, it's the deplorables who voted for them. They are the problem. No, we are the problem. And they didn't like that. I should, I should point out it didn't go well uh, with, with the journalists. Okay. But I think it's true. Because we've got to recognise why... I don't think people are stupid or deluded. As I was arguing earlier, populism is rooted, A, in the notion of a decline, a decline of things to which we are entitled, and secondly, a sense of lack of control. Take back control along with Make America Great Again, are two of the most brilliant, mm. brilliant slogans because they encapsulate in very few words something really critical. And the point is that both of them are true. It is true that there is a sense of decline for all sorts of reasons, including the geopolitical uh, political changes between America, the West, and, and, and China. There is loss. And there is, as I was arguing earlier, lack of control. Now, the point is that the populists recognise that. They give you, if you like, a, an illusory diagnosis and an illusory uh, cure. Mm. Right? They point the finger in the wrong direction right, to the immigrants. They say, we'll solve it through uh, building walls. But at least they recognise your lived experience. And when you're up against, as Trump was up against, the Clintons, who tend to deny the fact that things are getting worse, and deny the fact there is lack of control, you listen to the people who speak to your lived reality. And unless something else acknowledges it and has better diagnosis and better cures, the populists are going to be successful because they have tapped into those things. The other thing we didn't understand about the populists, and I think that's true of the Brexit campaign as well, is there's is a politics of transgression. Because they start from the premise that the elite, the establishment, the political process as a whole is against you, the people. Mm. Okay. And they prove that by violating the rules of politics. They are crude. They use sexualized terms. They, um, they're misogynistic and so on. But what they're doing in saying that is, I'm not like 
the normal politics are indifferent. Mm -hmm. right? And that politics of transgression, that showing your bottom to the boss, right, is first of all, it's quite entertaining and it's quite powerful. And secondly, it positions you as, I might be rough, I might be ready, but I am one of you and I'm against them. They understand that. But then what happens is each time they transgress, then they are criticised, so they have to invalidate those who do it. They have to invalidate the press as lying. They have to invalidate the laws as being... Uh, so it's a radicalising agenda. It doesn't necessarily start extreme, but I think Trump starts extreme. I think the politics of transgression takes him in that direction. So we need to understand that. And if I had to be critical of the, of the Brexit campaign, I remember the last evening uh, before the vote, uh, you know, there was a parade of the living prime ministers, which at one level, I think, you know, Remainers thought this shows there is consensus here. Everybody's against it. No. Mm. What it showed was the entire political class mm. are against Brexit. So it sustained the narrative of the Brexiteers. We didn't fully understand it. Clinton didn't fully understand it. So I would argue, first of all, we need understanding and we need analysis. In terms of dealing with it, well, as I say, I think we need to look at those issues of control. We need to look at those issues of loss. We need to have policies. And the one thing I would say about engagement, because I'm pleased we're talking so much about engagement, and the one thing I would say about democracy is I would argue that if we confine it to the political sphere, we are going to be extremely limited. We've got to take it out into all spheres of uh, uh, people's lives. I think if the Labour started off with an announcement that every you know, FTSE 100 uh, uh, company needed a third of the workforce on their board, that would be a pretty good start. I'd like to see that next week, and uh, I, can, I can write down a few other things as well. But democracy has got to be about everything in our lives. And if we confine it to politics, in a context where people are rejecting politics, mm. then I fear we're not going to find a solution. Would you like to add anything? Well, I, are we going to get some questions? Yes, we are going yes. to get some questions. questions. Can, can, I just, uh, can I just put in, I think there's a, yep. a, one important sort of fundamental point. Whenever we speak to people and try and persuade them to uh, get more involved in democracy, they, the, the things that they tell us, I end up listening and thinking, oh my God, you're right, we shouldn't bother. And on the one hand, we often say, look, you should get involved with politics. And then on the other hand, we say, look, the, this, this system doesn't work. There is no effective way of translating your will into the, the, the representation that you want to see in Parliament. We sort of saw that with the outcome of the, the election uh, this week. But part of that is because of the system that we have. First past the post is a winner-takes-all system. So if you come second, you get very little. Third, even less. If you're beyond that, you're, you're sort of lost in the, in the weeds. And any winner-takes-all system is bound to breed um, win-at-all-cost behaviours. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have. We have people in politics, huge numbers of them, who are experts in winning at all costs. And it doesn't take too much imagination to understand what that means. It means people who are prepared to bend or break the rules, to lie, to cheat, to find the loopholes, and that's what we have. And so whenever you talk to, whenever I talk to ordinary people about it, that's what they point to. They say, they're all crooks, they're all, why would I want to get involved in that? And so there's a, there's a sort of question there about the type of system that we have. Proportional representation, and I, and I put the caveat in, there are lots of different types of proportional representation. That's a debate. Uh, once we've established the principle, we can have that debate. But for now, I think people are interested in proportional representation because it doesn't drive us down that particular avenue. And I think um, Alexandra's point about the commission is a good one. Open Britain is currently uh, advocating a, a royal commission to look at the voting system. And we've been in talking to Starmer's people in the run-up to the election, trying to persuade them to do this, um, not in, in, in some sort of uh, view that says, look, do this out of the goodness of your heart, but trying to show them there's a, a, a good reason to do it and to do it quickly. 2028, uh, three years into this, uh, approximately three years into this parliament, will be the centenary uh, of, of when all women finally got the vote in 1928. So people will be talking about that. The spotlight will fall on democracy again. And we're saying that if we could have a royal commission that would go away and do all that mastication of the ideas and the thoughts and the options, 
and in doing so, bring in citizens' assemblies, do digital consultation, get ordinary people involved in that process, and then the product of that is something that could be implemented or at least committed to on the centenary of the last big upgrade of democracy, that would be a positive thing for the country. It would drive the engagement, show people that it's worth taking part, and ultimately deliver a system that does away with that win at all costs, winner takes all, and actually perpetuate the value of taking part. And so I think that's that, that's something that Open Britain are pushing. We've had sort of non-committal <laughs> responses to that, but we got. As some of you, if you read The Guardian, may have seen Polly Toynbee uh, has picked up the idea in the last week. So we're still hopeful that we can, we can win that argument. Great. Can I, can I just chip in? And I, know you, I, I know you want to answer your questions, but actually I want to react to a couple of things there. So I'm, I'm definitely happy that something gets done and nothing gets done. The only thing I worry about is that if you just have a commission on PR versus F first past the post... People's positions are entirely influenced by how it might affect them in the next election. And, and it's the same with if we just tinker with the House of Lords, it seems to be an easy win just to affect that. But we actually need a sort of a root and branch refreshing of our whole system. And, and bits we change here will, be, will have an impact on what happens there. And if we only affect that, then we need to take into account that. We need to actually have a a sort of a more holistic process, I personally think, because if we tinker with one bit, it will have knock-on repercussions in others. Um, so I personally would favour a broader, but I recognise you can get bogged down, um, so there are pros and cons there. The other thing is I really love the way you framed it, Stephen, about uh, democracy um, and politics. These are not remote domains and things that are done to us. And I think there has definitely become, I, I, again, maybe because I've lived in America now for so long, I do think we've all become a bit lazy about politics. It's sort of something that other people do and is done to us. And we risk being complacent or cynical or apathetic about the state of our democracy. And it's only as good as our own willingness to tend to our own democratic garden and weed out the unhealthy elements and take part in it. And democracy is a frame of mind. It's not just a remote sphere in Westminster, it's also how one approaches business, relationships, committees, community, everything. And in sort of reinvigorating that notion of democracy as a way of mind, how you approach every domain of your life. And it's not the domain of some remote breed of weird politicians. And finally, not all politicians are the same. I really dislike the cynicism. I believe what's happened in our system, like you said, the first pass of the post system rewards the most aggressive, <laughs> dirty tactic player. I believe a lot of people enter politics with extremely good intentions, and the system forces them down a track where in order to get money for your campaign you have to sort of build relationships with businesses in order to get a position of authority you have to obey the whips you have to do what you're told and before you know it you've become what you enter politics to try and get rid of um, so I, I, I do want us to fight that uh, cynicism as well It's been a very convenient myth that they're all the same, isn't it, hasn't it? I'm going to, I'm going to step out here so I can really see that we've got bright lights. It's hard to see. Um, can we start right back to you, sir, with your hand up? About that? Yeah, I'm thinking, oh, yes, yeah, um, I was always sort of thought about democracy being of the people, by the people, for the people. And it's sort of been said, yeah, that the institutions across, you know, across the political side and society and the should, should reflect back the people and, and democracy. And I think I sort of echo what, what um, Alex said uh, and Stephen about we, we really need to go into that and we really need to go hard in on the House of Lords and the monarchy. Because the monarchy, I find I so repulsive about monarchy is that we just sort of, they, they told, they're telling us that we're, they're going to slip it down. Like, well, no, we, you need to slip it down <laughs> because we tell you to slip it down. That's and and, and point. if we're supposed to be democratic and our values are democratic, how is that democratic? It's, yeah. it's so anachronistic, it's ridiculous. So we really need to go hard in on those things. And the House of Lords, get rid of the uh, hereditary peers tomorrow. They, it could be done. Uh, and it is, we should really go hard in on that, as well as, as, well as the uh, first past the post as well. So 
no, nothing is off limits to me. I mean, I think, I think we need to go in on that. Could we get around? Yes, yes, we have a round of us. Right. Yes, what do you want to ask? Okay. Everybody's talking about bringing things down to the locality. But no one in this whole conference is talking about local government. Um, now, I'm a 19th century historian, uh, specialising in public health, 19th century, early 20th century. That period, everything was local. Health, welfare, energy, municipal gas works, water, everything was local. Parliament and the laws weren't well, really there. What happened was down in the locality. Now, uh, and there in the locality was where lots of experiments were going on. 1928 wasn't when Ed Wigman got the vote. They got it much earlier in localities. Uh, local regions in this country have been, uh, have been doing, um, uh, getting on for doing proportional representation. Now, why isn't anybody talking about local government and how that could be the bedrock of lots of the things you're trying to suggest? Now, and no one's talking about it. It, it amazes me. In the 19th century, Britain was the most decentralised country in Europe. Now it's become the most centralised. Why did that happen? How did it happen? How do we get away from it? Very good points. Right. And uh, we'll, just, we'll build up a few. Yes. I, I wanted to think about... Uh, cons- uh, engaging with people. The United Nations has got the Summit of the Future coming up in September and we're going from the local to the bigger picture, how we can engage with <coughs> participatory democracy at that level. And, and, and also, just picking up on what Althea said, we've been in Newton Abbott, my constituency, talking to people on the streets and thinking about the, the cyclist who was our delivery delivery room driver, who when I said what would be your top three policy priorities for the next government said, um, bring back hanging. <laughs> and, 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 and he, he, uh, he said, you're all middle class. And I said, I come from a working, you know, a mining pit village. And he said, did you go to university? And I said, yes. And he said, well then, Prove it, you're a little kind. And that finding, and the women, a lot of women we encountered thanked us for being on the streets and being participatory. And I suspect that those women who thanked us were the women who would have been involved in the mutual aid organisation, Steve, that you spoke about during, during COVID. And I wonder if there's an element of genderedness in this authoritarian uh, populism that we're seeing. Right, can I take one more? Apparently we're being squeezed for time further. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the lady in the... Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just speaking about the localism. I mean, I, I think a lot of the stuff you're talking about is great, but it doesn't put any eyes on any people. And what I would like to suggest to the Labour government is spend the first two or three years giving people that sense of participation where they just get make a difference in their life. So re, 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 um, emphasize locality. You know, we used to have local health boards, health that's been privatised. We used to have um, schools where parents could be prepared with governors and actually make a difference and run the school. That's been academised. We used to have local government that actually made a difference. And people would see their local representatives on the street and talk to them. That's been completely pulled out. And I don't think unless the Labour government actually, and you know, all those proposed stigmas coming up with, they were absolutely part of McDonald's agenda and all those think tanks that were being um, encouraged to think about workplace democracy at that time. You know, and that, that agenda got completely shut down the way. So I think unless the Labour government can make people feel empowered in those small ways, genuine ways, then nobody's going to care, frankly, about your um, about your assemblies and your constitutional reform. So do that bit first. This habit of mind doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from people actually experiencing some power in their lives. And if people don't feel like power, they're not going to be interested in constitutional reform. George Monbiot has a very good phrase where he says, everything that should be de- can be decided locally should not be mandated nationally. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that kind of sums that position up. Um, we're being heavily squeezed, but if anybody wants to please follow up on the localism issue and gender... I'm just going to say I'm 100% in favour, and I apologise that I didn't explicitly uh, set that out. Um, my assumption in reviewing 
uh, constitutional makeup was also looking at the balance of powers between the national level and at the more local level. But I take your point, the best way to get people to participate is by actually doing it and actually, you know, you don't have to wait for this grand constitutional commission, some powers could be devolved. Um, I used to work on European Union matters, and there's a principle in the EU called subsidiarity that the British government used to campaign for very strongly, which is only things which had to be done at the EU-wide level should be done at the EU-wide level. Anything that could be left to the national level should be remitted to the national level. And that philosophy, I completely agree, should be applied internally within the UK as well. So... Um, I'm, I'm a totally agree with your suggestions. So I think because we're being hassled, not to me, <laughs> I think there are a lot of questions here that people want to raise and a lot of discussions that people want to have. So I'm going to propose that um, as West Country Voices, we will put together an online Zoom. We will invite as many of you as possible to join that. We'll get as many of the panel involved in that as we oh, can nice because this is a very, very big issue. And I think for the, for the moment, the wish list to the, to the Labour Party is Leveson 2, workers on every board, lots of um, um, community, lots of um, assemblies, citizens' assemblies, and a real root and branch assessment of our political system and our form of governance so that we bring back ownership to we, the people. Um, yeah. So a very, very big thank you to my panel, um, and thank you so much for being here. And we will follow up on this, because this sh squished hour is simply not enough. Yeah, and I hope you all it. agree with that. And I really appreciate the fact that you've put up with being moved and squished. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of which are desirable. So thank you all very much thank for you coming, for and we will follow up. Thank you. Yeah.